Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 84 of the Stroke Cast. This week, I want to talk about small things because small things matter. During my recent Botox visit, or actually my Dysport visit, I asked my physiatrist to go ahead and, and actually show me on my MRIs where my stroke was. I mean, a month or so after I got out of the hospital two years ago, I, I got the MRIs all on a DVD with the viewer, and I spent some time looking through all of my scans, my CT scans, my MRIs, uh, having a general idea of what I was looking for, but really not ever actually being able to find it. thought I found it a couple of times, but then it sort of moved around a little bit on those scans, so apparently that was not quite right. Who knew amateur radiology could be so challenging? But uh, she showed me on the screen, she told me which image I needed to look for, and so I, when I got home, I ultimately was able to pull up uh, my MRIs. It, it's interesting because... The CD or DVD you get with your scans uses a special medical imaging format. I believe it's called DICOM, D-I-C-O-M. So these pictures are not the JPEGs or the GIFs or the PNGs or the other graphics files we're used to seeing. So you can't just pop this disk into your computer and just pull it up right away. A lot of times the disk will actually come with a special program you need to use in order to read those scans. And for some reason, that wasn't working on my machine. Whatever the reason was, uh, I wasn't having much luck this year. I was able to open them last year. But regardless, last night, I went ahead and found a program to go ahead and view them, which is great. And I'll go ahead and link to that in the show notes. So if you have one of those disks with your own scans, you can go ahead and pull that up. And that program also lets you then export them to JPEG, which is really cool. And that's why also if you go to the show notes for this week's episodes, you'll actually be able to see the picture of my ischemic stroke. Uh, I know you're super excited about that. And I have taken incredible amusement, personal amusement in the idea of going ahead and exporting those images and then realizing I should just store these in the folder on my computer already labeled headshots. But regardless, that probably entertains nobody but me. But the point is that out of those hundreds and hundreds of images, there are a few where I can clearly see now this stroke in my MCA, my right MCA, middle cerebral artery, feeding the basal ganglia, among other things. The point I want to make here is that the middle cerebral artery is, on average, between 3.25 and 3.5 millimeters thick. Now, I know most folks around the world are like, wow, that is really small. Most Americans are going, what is that, like five feet or 30 gallons? We, we don't know. <laughs> Here's a short cut, shortcut for my American friends. A millimeter is roughly the thickness of a dime. So you can think of that middle cerebral artery as being about three and a half dimes thick. That's really freaking tiny. And yet that little tiny space in my head two years ago got blocked. Think about how little material it takes to block 3.25 to 3.5 millimeters. How little material it takes to make the thickness of three dimes. You think of the last scab you got when you cut your arm and that clotting activity and think about how much smaller a clot inside the head can be to have such a huge impact. That little tiny thing led to so much, led to starving just, again, a very small section of my brain, which took out my limbs cost me to spend a month in the hospital, cost my insurance company uh, around $200,000, and led to this entirely new life that I'm living now. Everything from the groups I'm now a part of to the 
84 episodes of this podcast so far that all exist because that little bit of material got in that very small space for a very short amount of time and led to this huge change in my life and the potentially small, potentially medium, whatever impact I'm able to have on dozens or hundreds of other people just from that little small thing. Because those small things do make a very big difference. And I think that's important to keep in mind because a lot of times those of us who go through this experience and start living with disabilities now start to think about how hard it is to do things and what is, what, what future do we have? What can we do now? All of our dreams have changed maybe and that we can't do anything. The point is though, that we can do small things. Small things got us to where we are. Small things can get us to where we want to go. We can do small things that will have an impact, that will make somebody's life a little bit better, that will make the world around us just a little bit better. A few weeks ago, I talked about another small thing, about the challenges I had in rehab, opening jelly packets. And again, I'll link to that episode in the show notes if, if you wanted to go back and listen to that one if you don't remember it. But basically, the jelly packets you got with uh, the breakfast tray in the hospital were like those little um, diner style where you have to peel back the, uh, the foil off the little plastic cup and then apply the jelly to your pastry. But of course, when you have only one functioning hand, you can't do that which led to starting every day with a failure and yada, yada, yada. And I talked a lot more about it a few weeks back, like I said. The point I want to make here, though, is that I shared that story. I shared that story with the hospital leadership, and I shared that story on the podcast. And now as a result of that, I didn't expect this to happen, but I know at least two hospitals that are now working on changing their sourcing or changing their procedures so that stroke survivors don't have to deal with that. That's going to impact the lives of hundreds of people a year at those two hospitals. And the people whose lives that are going to be impacted by it are never going to know about that. They're never going to know that this was a problem that need to be sol needed to be solved because it was a small one. But they're going to start their days with a little bit less frustration. And that's something that I'm really happy about, that just sharing that little story, that little anecdote is able to make a difference to people, is able to make a lot of people's lives just a tiny bit better in a way they may not even know. And it doesn't take much to go ahead and share those stories and to share your experience and to share things like what happened to me. And we all have those platforms available now, whether it's going to be through a podcast, whether it's going to be through a YouTube vlog, whether it's going to be through Instagram posts or Facebook updates or tweets or whatever it is, whether it's going to be in our uh, support group meetings, whether it's going to be at the hospitals that we may have been a part of and we may have worked with to just go back and share our stories and our experiences and just little things that can make a difference. We don't have to go ahead and lead the cause and lead the change and redo the bureaucracy and take on these projects. All we have to do is share our stories, share our experiences, because the people in those institutions, the people who work there, they're doing it because they want to make their patients' lives better. They want to make the lives of the people they touch a little bit better. And sometimes just sharing our stories, that's all it takes. That's all you have to do in order to have an impact. As we look to the future of some of the new technologies that are happening, again, small things are going to make a big difference. And whereas the jelly story is really more of a metaphorical small thing, I want to talk now about some new tiny technology that can make a difference for future stroke survivors or for those of us who go back for another stroke. Quite frankly, I, I, the one was enough for me. I have no desire to return to that buffet line. but. MIT has just released some news about an experimental technology that has the potential to revolutionize mechanical thrombectomy. A little bit of background here. 
we're talking about treating ischemic strokes, although there is some potential to, I imagine, to treat hemorrhagic strokes as, as well. Ischemic strokes, of course, are ones that are caused by a, a clot a perm, or, more specifically, a blockage in a, an artery that leads to brain tissue beyond that uh, blockage dying off. Most commonly, it's due to a blood clot. In uh, other cases, it other things can cause it too, like we heard last week with Deborah Meyerson's experience. A hemorrhagic stroke is, of course, a failure of one of those arteries that results in a hole in the artery and blood gets out of the artery and then starts squirting into the brain and doing damage and everything from the pressure of the blood pumping into brain tissue, which is not supposed to happen, to starving tissue that's beyond where that leak is because the blood isn't getting there, to just the general poisonous nature of physical blood touching brain tissue. So lots of things go wrong there. And of course, uh, about 80% of strokes are ischemic. They are blockage-based. About 20% are hemorrhagic. They are bleed-based. But regardless, they are a failure of the circulatory system. Over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, treatment of ischemic strokes has really changed. Everything from the introduction of clot-busting medications like TPA, which you can get within a certain amount of time and they can go ahead and dissolve a clot, to in more recent years, what's become really prominent has been the use of mechanical thrombectomy. But what happens in a mechanical thrombectomy is that a neurosurgeon goes ahead and runs a line or a catheter up through the arteries in either the groin or the wrist. They thread that manually through the body, through those arteries, up into the brain to get to where the clot is and then attempt to pull that clot out and release that blockage so the blood can get through and it can minimize the disability that the person has. Obviously, not every neurosurgeon can do this. It requires special training and special facilities and special equipment which is why if you have a stroke in a major metropolitan area, you're more likely to be able to get this treatment than in some more rural areas. And there are lots of things that go along with that. Of course, while this has grown tremendously over the last several years, and the time in which you can do this has grown tremendously over the last several years, it's still not as widespread as we would like. And it poses challenges. First of all, as part of the procedure, it actually subjects the uh, neurointerventionalist to uh, additional radiation from basically the, the X-ray-like technology they have to use in order to continue to monitor this process as they're steering this catheter up through the body, which is not an easy process. Also, as you're steering this up through the circulatory system, through those arteries, you have the potential to actually damage those arteries in the process, and you're causing additional trauma to an already traumatized circulatory system. So those are some of the challenges with it. Obviously, the benefits significantly outweigh the costs, which is why that treatment has become so popular. When we talk about small things. We're already talking about very small threads and very small things to actually steer them up through there. What MIT has just demonstrated is a really tiny robot, essentially, that can be put into those veins and can be even steered remotely using magnetic technology. And it can bend more easily to get around all of the corners and all of the twists and turns in those arteries to get to wherever the blockage needs to be cleared. And they're using a special coating on that, which makes it extra slippery. So it does less damage to the arteries as it's on its way up there. Because it can be controlled uh, more remotely with magnets as well, the neurointerventionalist doesn't even need to be in the same room and continue to pick up additional radiation exposure over the course of their career as they do more and more of these procedures. Plus, this little tiny robot can then deliver a payload, and that may be something to physically remove a clot. It may be medication that can be deployed in that spot, or it could even be lasers. I mean, and the sci-fi geek in me just loves the idea of putting this little robot in your body with a laser on it to go in and go ahead and shoot up that clot and destroy that so it can't do any more damage. And of course, the dystopian in me also realizes that is a terrifying thought in the wrong hands. But the idea of this little robot going into your body with this laser to go ahead and repair this damage or 
prevent further damage is just awesome. And then the idea that you can go ahead and do this also means that this tiny robot can get into some smaller spaces potentially than traditional mechanical thrombectomy, especially as technology advances further. And as you start talking about delivering additional payloads and performing additional operations, now you get even more flexibility to go ahead and potentially repair other things down the road. Now, this is not necessarily a technology that's going to be deployed tomorrow. There's still lots more research and study that needs to be done but it is something that can be a part of treatment in the future and can help minimize disabilities resulting from strokes in the future. Because we want to go ahead and be able to treat stroke by first preventing strokes from happening, second by when they do happen, minimizing the damage that they do, and third, when the damage has done has been done by working more on therapy and post-stroke care to help restore functionality. And this little thing is one thing that can take care of that step two of the process. And so it's really promising to see this technology, and I hope we see more of it in the future. So that's the whole thing, though. These little things that are happening, whether they are going to be that little thing that causes that 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 stroke, that little tiny blockage, whether it's going to be a little thing we can do to improve the experience of patients in the hospital, or whether it's going to be a little thing that can go into our bodies to prevent damage in the first place. Little things are powerful. And when you can only do small things with your disabilities, or you may not be able to envision doing big things, that's okay. Do the little things. Go ahead and get those little things done. When I was in the hospital, of course, and going through PT, we had this route around the halls that they would try to walk us. And the tile floor actually had uh, some diamonds imprinted in it, you know, just sort of blue tile diamonds just make the floor a little bit more interesting. And as I was going through that and different, I would have my morning session of PT and my afternoon session of PT or whatever, and we go ahead and do the walk. And it's 100 feet, couple hundred feet, whatever it was, it was hard. And at first it was only able to go 20 feet. Maybe I could make it up halfway the, up the hallway and have to take a break. Maybe I could then make it all the way up the hall to the bench at the end before we make the loop around. But the point was, is as I would go through that, I would just try and do just a little bit more every day, just make a, another small improvement. And if in the morning I got to say the first tile diamond in this floor in the afternoon when we would do that walk i wouldn't want to necessarily double or triple my distance i would just want to make it to the second tile diamond in the floor an additional maybe two or three feet and then the next time maybe let's make it to that third tile diamond in the floor these small improvements are how we grow these small improvements are how we're able to recover making just that little bit more distance, just a little bit at a time. I didn't have to get get perfect where I could walk all around the hospital on my own. I didn't have to. I just had to make it just another two or three feet, just make it to that extra diamond, make it just that one little bit further. That's all I needed to do. Every episode of this show wraps up with the idea of don't get best, get better. That idea is so important to me because a lot of times we get obsessed with the idea of being the best and being perfect and getting everything exactly where we need to be and being able to win and and accomplish everything fully. But we don't have to be the best at everything that we do, despite the cultural implication that we do. You see, the problem with being the best at everything we do is it means that everybody else has to be worse than us. And in order for somebody else to be the best at that, they have to defeat us. They have to drive us down to second best or third best or fourth best. But we don't have to be the best. And we certainly don't have to be the best tomorrow. All we have to do is just get a little bit better every day. Just make it a few extra feet, a few extra steps. Just a little bit. And if we get just a little bit better every day, get just a little bit further every day, make just a tiny bit of progress towards our goals every day. 
before you know it, we've made it all the way to where we want to be. We've made it all the way to that big accomplishment we wanted to do. Just by focusing on getting just a little bit better. Just make small improvements. Because those small improvements matter. Those small improvements build on one another. And those small improvements add up to huge gains. So as you go through whatever it is, whatever project it is you're pursuing, professional, personal, recovery-related, whatever it is, I would encourage you to just don't try to get best. Just get better all the time. A little bit. That's all that matters. Strive for that, and you get to where you want to go. And that brings us to our hack of the week. I've been eating a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches lately. I don't know why I'm on this kick, but they're easy for me to make, and they're convenient, and they're not as unhealthy for me as, say, microwaving uh, a couple of grocery store chimichangas or, or whatever. So it's probably an improvement for that perspective. And continuing in this theme of talking about jelly, and I've been talking a lot about jelly over the last few weeks, here's my latest trick for getting jelly onto a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And that's to use a spoon. I don't know if this is a one-handed thing, but or, or, or is really great for two-handed use as well. But one of the things, for, for my entire life, I've been making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches by using a butter knife to get jelly out of the jar and then smear it onto the bread. And that's difficult because the jelly doesn't want to stay on top of the, the, the uh, knife as you're pulling it out of the jar. So you end up putting it back, and it's hard to get it out there and manage it. What I'm doing now is I'm using a teaspoon. So just use a teaspoon, spoon some jelly out of the jar, onto the bread, and then use the back of the spoon to go ahead and spread it out. It is so much easier to do this one-handed. Don't have to tilt the jar in the same way. Don't have to go through nearly the hassle. I did try to use a butter knife, and it's just something that works. And one of these days, once I have my, my left hand back, I'm guessing that when I make my PB&Js, I'm going to continue to try and uh, apply the jelly with a spoon. Scoop it out with a spoon, spread it out with the back of the spoon. So that's it for this week. If you want to see pictures of my uh, MRI with that, that stroke, go ahead and check out the show notes for episode 84 over at strokecast.com slash small things. Be sure to follow me on Instagram where I'm sharing even more content uh, on occasion and doing some more live videos lately. You can follow me over at bills underscore strokecast or just go to strokecast.com slash Instagram. Do you have a stroke-related project that you're working on, whether it's a blog, a podcast, a book, whatever? Go ahead and tell me about it. Go ahead and visit strokecast.com slash myproject and fill out the form. Uh, I hope to feature some more of those projects in future episodes of the Strokecast. Be sure to share this episode with a friend, colleague, or your preferred medical provider by giving them the link strokecast.com slash small things. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you next week. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.